and also for the invitation to be here. It's a, a pleasure to be back here, even though this time I have to work harder and, and, than I usually do when I'm in the PRO, which is to uh, consult records rather than to, uh, rather than to give lectures. Uh, so, uh, the, the 1918 general election was widely hailed uh, as hugely important in British political life. The first post-war election with universal male suffrage, limited female suffrage as we hear, and the vote for soldiers. The newspapers were unanimous in their verdict. Though, of course, looking at this through different uh, political lenses, you'll notice that the front page of the newsletter on the 30th of December 1918 uh, barely mentioned the election at all. You can see some reference to it in the top right hand corner, but this is the norm for uh, newspapers at the time to give priority to uh, uh, advertisements on their front page over, over news. News is always on the inner pages. But nevertheless, uh, uh, the, the election was, of course, covered in great detail in the newspaper, in, in the newsletter, and in other newspapers. The, how, the, uh, what they've singled out for, for particular comment here is a bit unusual. A nationalist party of seven, a reference to the fact that the nationalists were now back with only seven seats. In fact, only six seats on the island of Ireland. The seventh seat was in Liverpool. The Scotland division of Liverpool had been a national, an Irish nationalist seat for many, many years, held by um, T. P. O'Connor. National Party 7 and Dillon's decisive defeat, uh, the defeat of John Dillon, the leader of the party, which is seen as symbolizing the, the shock that this uh, particular election delivered. In some ways, this is a strange way of presenting the results because it, 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 the Nationalist Party of Seven is dramatic enough, but even more dramatic was the fact that there was now a Sinn Fein party of 73. And Dillon's decisive defeat was, of course, de Valera's decisive victory. So the, the, the election itself represented a huge change. So what I propose to do in, the, in this presentation is to begin by looking at the election in context, the historical setting of the 1918 general election, we looked at in the context of Irish electoral history. I look at the results themselves in brief, and then I'll try to um, offer some interpretive comments about these results from three perspectives. Uh, the, the first is the significance of the election for Irish political history and Irish political development, uh, its impact on domestic politics at the time, in other words. Second, the election was extremely interesting from a, a com the point of view of comparative politics. Nothing like it ever happened in uh, an advance, in, well, in, a, in an, emerging, an emerging democracy. I'll come back to that point. Uh, I'm, making this point because I'm not a historian, I'm a political scientist rather than a historian. And third, I'll, I'll refer to one part of the legacy of the 1980 general election that in important respects is still with us, a particular strand of, 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 of nationalist uh, ideology. So, to look briefly at Irish electoral history, at the context of the, the long uh, historical context of the election, uh, after the Union of 1800, Ireland's representation in the House of Commons, and the House of Commons is approximately the same size as it is today. Uh, Ireland's representation was 100 MPs, uh, two from each county, one or two from each borough, depending on the size of the borough, and uh, two from Trinity, uh, Trinity College, Dublin. Now, interestingly enough, as the 19th century progressed, the pattern of Irish representation in the House of Commons increasingly began to resemble the religious map of the island. I'll illustrate this in a moment. This was particularly began to be the case after the general elections of 1830, 1831, and especially 1832. A particular pattern was laid down that was to persist until the 1980s, specifically until the general election of 1885. Uh, so I'll illustrate that in a moment. Then, in, just before 1880, the general election of 1885, there was another major reform act which introduced substantial manhood suffrage. Most male heads of household became entitled to the vote. Women, not at all, of course. This confirmed the emergence on the island of two parties and no more than two. Every other minor grouping was squeezed out. Two parties, uh, the, uh, the, the Unionist Party and the Nationalist Party. Uh, so to illustrate this, this process, this map actually shows the results, a summary of the results of all elections about 10 general elections between 1830, 1835 and 1880. 
And you see a quite remarkable pattern emerging already at this stage. Clearly, out, you can see clearly outlined here the, the boundaries of Ulster, the province of Ulster. Uh, and inside that area, uh, representation was confined to the Tory party, as it was in the early 19th century, later to become the Conservative Party, then in the 1880s to become the Conservative and Unionist Party. Outside Ulster, there's almost no Conservative or Tory representation. So in the, in the rest of the island, with certain exceptions, so Dublin, Counties Dublin, Wicklow, um, Carlow, Queen's County, Sligo, we do get um, a, a reasonable level of Tory or Conservative representation. And there are two boroughs in the south also, which uh, typically turn, returned Tory or uh, Conservative members. Uh, Port Arlington uh, here, and Bandon in Cork. Um, so we get this remarkable pattern of relative electoral stability in the case of the 19th century. In fact, complete electoral st stability on the Tory side, on the side of the nation to become the Unionist Party. The Tory party in the 19th century became increasingly the, Tory, the, the party of Protestants, of landlords, of the party which valued the link with Great Britain. And then there were the others. The others were mainly the Liberals, or the Whigs or Liberals, but as the 19th century progressed, the Liberals or Whigs in this white area here were pushed aside by other parties. O'Connell's Repeal Party in the 1830s and 1840s, the Independent Irish Party in the 1850s, and the Home Rule Party in the 1870s. Now it's very hard to distinguish between these parties and the Liberals. The boundaries between the two were fluid. But between this, these sets of parties, which were supported largely by Catholics, and the Conservative Party, there was a gulf. There was a huge, there was a huge gulf. Uh, so that was the position in, for most of the 19th century. This division became starker in 1885, with the introduction of manhood suffrage and revision of constituency boundaries. So we get the, the, this pattern by which Conservatives or Tories are confined to the uh, to, to four counties, substantially confined to four counties in Ulster. Uh, so, even more remarkably, um, I've reproduced here the results of all elections, eight elections from 1885 to uh, 1910. Uh, it's unusual that one can do this. It illustrates the extent to which there's almost no, um, uh, almost no change in the political map of Northern Ireland in this period. We get this, the emergence of this characteristic horseshoe-shaped pattern of support. So in those areas shaded, uh, shaded orange, where there was a Protestant majority, the tendency was for only uh, Unionist, Conservative or Unionist MPs to be returned. So you see there, uh, in North Antrim, for example, seven out of eight returned in this period. Uh, South Antrim, eight out of eight. And then we get the opposite pattern in predominantly nationalist areas, with a single exception, North Fermanagh. For, for, some, for some reason, the Catholic majority in North Fermanagh was quite small, and this allowed a, 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 a conservative or unionist normally to win this. So we get this, uh, let me draw your attention again to this uh, horseshoe shape of support for the unionist party. The reason I'm drawing that to your attention is, if we move on a few years, so I'm looking forward after the, after, the, uh, after the election. If we move on, move on a few years to look at elections from 1929 to 1965 to the Northern Ireland House of Commons, we get almost exactly the same kind of shape, this horseshoe shape again. Uh, so leaving aside uh, South Down, South Armagh, South Fermanagh, and parts of Tyrone and Derry. Uh, you know, it's absolutely remarkable that when we produce these kinds of maps, this, this is impossible in any other country in Europe. We don't get this level of electoral stability anywhere else. This is stability that goes back to 1885 and ended only in 1969. And maybe it didn't end even then, but in a formal sense it ended in 1969. So that every election from 1885 to 1965, oh, an eight year period, at every election this period, the same two parties contested elections with substantially the same outcome. Now, I'm oversimplifying a little. For example, I'm skipping the much more complex story of what went on in Belfast, which is quite different. But if we look at rural Northern Ireland, you have this kind of remarkable pattern of Protestant constituencies that only return unionist MPs. The result was so uh, 
foregone a conclusion that there were constituencies like Banside here, Terence O'Neill's constituency, which he never had to contest. He was returned at a by-election in 46, 1946, I think it was. Never contested an election until 1969, because this, there was no point in the contest here. And then we get the, the mirror image of this in nationalist uh, Northern Ireland. Now, I'm straying a little from the, the story of the 1918 election. So, let's move back to 1918. What was different about this particular election that occurred in the middle of that pattern of electoral history that I illustrated? Well, first thing that happened was a huge expansion of the franchise. Uh, a whole tranche of new unaligned voters became available for mobilization. And we know from the study of comparative uh, 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 elections, that when voters become available like this, new parties can grab them. So this is hugely significant. So the electorate almost trebled. Furthermore, um, it, it, as it happened, a, a huge uh, majority of voters had never voted before, much larger than the figure I just quoted. Uh, and the reason for this has to do with the large, very large proportion of uncontested constituencies in pre-1918 Ireland. For example, in the constituency of West Donegal, the last time at which people went to the polls before 1918 was 1880. So the 1880 election of, uh, was the last of which uh, voters there went to the polls. Now, they did vote in local elections, of course, uh, but for parliamentary elections, for politicized elections, or heavily politicized elections, 1880 was the last time. So by my calculation, of those Almost 2 million people who voted in 1918, only 360,000, less than 20%, had voted before. So the significance of this is these were available for mobilization uh, by Sinn Féin. Now, a factor that's often forgotten is that uh, Ireland and indeed the United Kingdom were not unique in undergoing a traumatic election this time. This is the norm in Europe, that everywhere else in Europe, too, there was a, an international climate of electoral and political revolt, as I suggest here. So uh, 1917, 1918 was, were, was a period of revolt, 1917, 1919, or 1920 even, a period of revolt all over Europe, Bolsheviks taking over in Russia, in Hungary, as, uh, similar revolts even in Germany. So it's likely that this would have had an impact on Ireland anyway, even though um, a few people have tried to assess what it might have been, uh, what the, this impact might have been. Uh, in addition, there were issues specific to Ireland. Uh, the, the most obvious was that the Home Rule question had not been resolved. If anything, the Home Rule question was made more difficult to resolve by the 1980, result of the 1918 election. Uh, the impact of the 1916 rising uh, on a new reorganized Sinn Féin party uh, was enormous. So Sinn Féin was founded either in 1905 or 1907 or 1908, depending on how you define when a party is formed, by Arthur Griffith. It was transformed in 1917 when uh, Eamon de Valera took over as leader and uh, pushed it in a more radical direction. Uh, 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 and the reaction of the public to the British handling of the 1916 rising, again as we're aware, had the effect of pushing many of these new voters into the arms of Sinn Féin. There's also a very substantial nationalist alienation following the so-called conscription crisis of 1980. The proposal to um, uh, uh, conscript uh, Irish people, and Irish men, uh, in the British Army. So, given this context, what is the result of the election itself? Uh, so, to look at the headlines, uh, na the Nationalist Party went in to the election as by far the largest Irish party. It no longer had 83 seats. At the previous election, which is way back eight years earlier, in 1910, it had won 83 seats. These have been whittled away through deaths and through by-election defeats. But in any event, uh, they lost almost all of these seats, surviving with only six, plus one in, um, in, in, in England, in Liverpool. Sinn Féin had no seats at all before 1917. It had contested elections against the Nationalist Party, was, but was entirely able to make any inroads. Its first ever elect, major electoral victory, it was its first ever parliamentary electoral victory, was in the Roscommon by-election of 1917, uh, when it won its first seat. But in the following general election, it was returned with 73 seats. 
Union support remains solid. Uh, in fact, the number of unionist seats increased from 17 in 1910 to 23 in 1918. Now, this, this is not because of any uh, additional votes won by the unionist side. This had to do with the uh, redistribution of seats. Uh, the, 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 the parliamentary constituencies before 1918 were based on the uh, census of 1881. They were drawn up in 1884, 1884, 1885. Uh, and the population changed a lot since then. Ulster was in general underrepresented by 1918. So uh, this gain of number of seats arose because uh, Belfast City, in particular, was given uh, more seats in electoral in a, in a boundary revision of 1918. And finally, there's a huge geographical difference between the two, two parts of the island. Uh, the, the complete elimination of the Nationalist Party in the south. Uh, so in the south, it won only two seats, four in Northern Ireland, only two in the south, in Donegal, which is hardly the south any, but in any event, in Donegal East, and uh, in, in, in Waterford. Uh, uh, so the Nationalist Party completely eliminated there. Relative stability in the north, Sinn Féin made some inroads in the north, but the Nationalist Party, remarkably enough, managed to hang on. And in fact, it reorganized after 1921 and um, continued on in Northern Ireland until the early 1970s. It was sub substantially replaced by the SDLP. So, to look at the geographical shape of, the, of these results, uh, you'll see here again the characteristic horseshoe shape pattern of support in. Uh, in the northern part of the island. So here's the, uh, the, the, uh, the Union's daily wicks of uh, what's now Northern Ireland. And we have some nationalists retired in East Donegal in four areas within Northern Ireland and in, 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 in Waterford. But other than that, we see a stark geographical contrast between the two parts of the island. To summarize this, if we uh, compare the results of 1910 with those of 1918, uh, you'd see the virtual disappearance of the Nationalist Party, the rise of a new party, Sinn Féin, uh, and uh, a, a growing strength on the part of the Unionist Party. The little blue at the top is uh, one liberal in West Tyrone, in, elected in 1910, but the, the seat was, of course, lost. In Southern Ireland, a much starker picture. Uh, it, Going into the election, uh, the Southern Irish representation was completely monopolised by uh, the uh, Nationalist Party. These seats now virtually all went to uh, Sinn Féin, leaving only two nationalists in constituents that I mentioned. You notice that there were two Unionist uh, members in 1910. These both represented Trinity College Dublin. Uh, unionist, Southern Unionists actually increased their strength by one in the general election with the victory of Morris Dockrell in Rathmines. Uh, a constituency in Dublin, uh, so resulting in three union seats in the south. Uh, and in Northern Ireland, pa the pattern that I described already, uh, complete domination by the Unionist Party, with the nationalist side divided between the Nationalist Party and Sinn Féin. Um, this, the Nationalist Party's survival in Northern Ireland was helped by the fact that there was an electoral pact between the two sides, brokered by uh, Cardinal Logue. Uh, but that kind of pattern was to conti continue on in Northern Ireland, as I mentioned, and was to continue on in almost exactly that form until uh, the um, late 1960s, when part of the system became much more fragmented. Now, there are different interpretations of this result. Um, Sinn Féin's critics were not slow to point out that Sinn Féin was supported by only 25% of the electorate. Now, that's true, but this is a misleading way of interpreting elections. So if you assume, uh, you assume that all people who did not vote would have, would have voted against um, this party. On the other hand, um, there are people like uh, De Valera himself, who published a pamphlet claiming that, in fact, 64% of the Irish people had voted for Sinn Féin. He did this by adding in the all voters in constituencies were uncontested. They were returned, they were returned they were, uh, Sinn Féin camp was returned unopposed. De Valera claimed all the electorate in these constituencies as Sinn Féin supporters. 
The conventional calculation, we just to express the Sinn Féin voters percentage of those voting, this is give us a figure of 47%, an uncomfortable one, because it implies that Sinn Féin did not have a majority in the island of Ireland. However, this is a bit unfair, because there were a large number of constituencies, 25, in which the opposition to Sinn Féin did not even contest the constituency. So if we make allowance for these, as I've done, I came up with an estimate of about 52%. So to summarize these interpretations, pick the one you like best. Uh, so um, uh, five different ways of presenting. Here's Sinn Féin support. It won either 25% or 33 or 47 or 52 or 64 on the island of Ireland. This is the conventional one. This is probably the most accurate representation of, of the party strength. Uh, <coughs> so what about the significance of the election then? Uh, first, is domestic significance. Well, uh, aided by the electoral system, Sinn Féin won a stunning victory. 92% of seats in the South, with only 65% of the vote in the South. Uh, but this uh, underproportional representation, nat the Nationalist Party would have done much better underproportional representation. It would have come back with around 23 or 24 seats. Um, uh, it, it was close to its share of the vote. The result confirmed a huge North South division. And it made compromise much more difficult because the nationalists, who were open to some kind of compromise with the unionists, were replaced by Sinn Féin, who were not open to compromise. Uh, the outcome was seen by Sinn Féin as an endorsement of their policy. As we know, then they went on to uh, ignore Westminster and set up the Doyle in Dublin. Second, what about the international and comparative significance of, of this election? Uh, something happened here in Ireland. Uh, for which there's virtually no parallel elsewhere in Europe. Uh, a, a modern, well-organized party. So the Nationalist Party was not just a collection of MPs. Like, it, was not, not, it did not resemble Eddie McAteer's Nationalist Party of the 1960s, which had almost no organization. This is a very, very well-organized, modern electoral machine with a world of thousand branches and tens of thousands of members, and a well-articulated organizational structure. Parties of this kind never disappear at an election like that. Um, uh, uh, so, so uh, what happened here was, was quite remarkable because this particular party, the National Party, did disappear. Um, so that's one remarkable development. The complete disruption of the system in the south of Ireland in 1980. Uh, remarkable, we get remarkable continuity in Northern Ireland, also unprecedented in European electoral history. It's not possible to produce maps of the kind I showed you from, um, for any other part of Europe. Uh, finally, there's the contemporary significance of um, the, the uh, <coughs> 1918 result. And I've quoted here from uh, Tom McGuire, who was seen by Republicans as the um, living embodiment of the first, of, of the first and second dollar. So they saw Maguire as representing uh, the wishes of the people of Ireland as articulated in 1918. And again, you, you'd be familiar with the kind of arguments that Republicans have traditionally put forward. 1918 was the only occasion on which the people of Ireland collectively, on the island of Ireland, were allowed to vote and determine their future. They made a decision, and the only way in which that decision could be reversed was by another collective vote of the Irish people, meaning all people on the island of Ireland. And thus it was that John Hume piloted the idea of building a referendum into the Good Friday Agreement, uh, which was designed precisely to, to undermine this particular ideological plank on which uh, what we said for so long, so long uh, depended. So to conclude, uh, the election confirmed the gulf between North and South on the island of Ireland. It created a new set of title deeds for an independent state so as to appear gradually in uh, Southern Ireland, and it left an enduring ideological message and source of validation to those who saw the partition of Ireland as unfinished business. And from the broader perspective of comparative electoral history, nothing like it happened before, nor did it happen again uh, in the countries of Europe. Um, I'm going to take us back and look at uh, how women here campaigned 
uh, to win the vote for themselves in this period. Now, the campaign for votes for women uh, obviously began when the great reform acts of the 19th century began to broaden the male franchise, extending the right to vote, first to the new rising middle class and then going on to embrace working men. And from the 1860s, women began to question why they were excluded and began to form themselves. They had already um, been apart, Britain and Ireland together in this, of course, uh, but some women had already been uh, sending in petitions and so forth. Uh, challenging the status quo. The most famous of the uh, suffrage societies in the UK is, is that of the Pankhurst, undoubtedly, uh, the Women's Social and Political Union. I certainly grew up knowing about that, knowing nothing at all about anything that happened in Ireland. But in Ireland too, the demand began to be heard. And I think it's important that we stress the um, interaction, if you like, between British and Irish uh, suffragists uh, in this period. The first society in Ireland, right, um, we get different dates, certainly from 1871, Isabella Todd, a Scotswoman who came to live uh, in Belfast, began agitating uh, for the vote and then formed uh, the, uh, I keep meaning to change that and I've forgotten that, pick up the Northern Ireland uh, Suffrage Society, it was the Irish Women's Suffrage Society slip in my thoughts when I was doing that. This is Isabella Todd, who was one of the most remarkable women uh, in Belfast politics during this period. This is Margaret Byers, who was secretary uh, of that first suffrage society. Um, I'll come back to these two again later because I think they're very important in the whole campaign and the context one of the most difficult things in doing any kind of history talk at all is that we have to separate everything out to make a narrative when in fact there were loads of things all happening at the same time which impacted on each other. So again, if you can bear that complication in mind. Uh, in 1876, um, the Belfast Society became associated with the Dublin Women's Suffrage Society which was formed by the Quaker couple uh, Thomas and Anna Haslam. And here you can see the logic of the argument they put forward. Women are citizens of the state, inheritors with men of all the history which ennobles a nation, guardians with men of all the best life of the nation, bound as much as men are bound to consider the good of the whole and justified as much as men are justified in sharing the good of the whole. So a very logical, um, rational argument. However, these kind of um, uh, theoretical arguments, if you like, I feel became stronger when educational changes began to change the opportunities open uh, to young women, and particularly young middle class women. Uh, and that takes us back to Margaret Byers, missionary widow, uh, who in 1859 opened Victoria College for Girls. Now, that was because, uh, those of you who have read Middlemarch and so forth, you'd be aware that education for middle class or upper class girls in this period was really confined to teaching them the skills that would help them to get a husband. Um, you know, a little embroidery, language, a bit of music and so forth. Uh, but increasingly throughout Britain, uh, people began, again this is to do with the rising middle class of the period. But what were the daughters? of those middle classes going to do. Uh, there weren't enough sort of uh, aristocrats or men of their own class to marry them off to. So this kind of school, Victoria College, offered academic facilities to those young women. Uh, they're here in the chemistry lab, I really like that photograph, um, but in fact they also taught things such as Latin and Greek, uh, which of course were essential for um, entrance to university from which young women were debarred in this period. So there was an ongoing um, impetus during this time to make things better uh, for young women of these rising classes. Isabella Todd, great friend of Margaret Byers, constantly visiting Victoria College and so forth, um, were determined to move this along. Uh, many of these young women would have become either teachers back at the same kind of college, Alexandra College in Dublin opened shortly afterwards and was followed by many more. Um, 
or they would become governesses uh, and so forth. But their opportunities were quite limited. But Todd was part of the wider British female campaign to have girls' uh, educational abilities taken more seriously. So that in the 1870 Education Ireland Act, which opened, um, again this is part of the moving from the privilege of the aristocracy to uh, you know, uh, promotion and so forth uh, by merit. So that you, you got the secondary act, opened up exams for young boys at secondary level so that they could move on through the, the civil service or army, navy, whatever um, systems. And it was due to lobbying by women that that act in 1878 included girls, which meant that at Victoria College, girls could take exams and prove their uh, academic ability, despite all the things that were said about them being incapable of so-called brain work. Now, that was important because uh, in the 1879 Universities Ireland Act, which brought together the colleges, Queen's Colleges of Cork, uh, Galway and Belfast to become the Royal University of Ireland, that University Act, again due to the lobbying uh, by women, including Todd uh, in this period, admitted uh, young women to the Royal University of Ireland. These are the first nine graces, as the newspapers call them somewhat. Um, <laughs> dismissively. Uh, I think it's lovely inspirational once. Not that long ago, the first group uh, of female undergraduates. And I think this changing context is very important. Not least because as the male uh, franchise uh, continues <coughs> to broaden, the differences, the reasons for men and women being able to vote changed. As Haslam said in 1886, it's not easy to keep our temper when we see the most illiterate labourer with no two ideas in his head exercising the very important function of self-government while educated women, capable in every way of giving a rational vote, are still debarred. So it changes things, doesn't it? The male franchise extending amongst the male working class, but women, educated or not, are still uh, excluded. Uh, Hannah Shea Skeppington provided a good example of this. She was asked to join a suffrage society uh, in, in Dublin. She's probably the most famous of the Irish uh, suffragists and, and my colleague Margaret has done uh, a great deal of, of work on her. She said, I, I was then an undergraduate and was amazed and disgusted to learn that I was classed among criminals, infants and lunatics. In fact, that my status as a woman was worse than any of these. It's not going to change anytime soon. Um, so you can see how uh, things that are, are, are changing. She became a convinced feminist immediately. What did they hope to achieve, these women? Lots of different ideas. Just as people voted maybe for the same party in an election, but for different reasons, so women's position uh, was held for different reasons. Those who were suffragists, and I always feel if I asked the women in the room, we would see these same differences uh, today. Uh, many women wanted to vote, as we've seen, to be equal with men, as a matter of fairness and equality. Many women wanted to vote for women because they argued that women were different from men and that they would bring something different into the political arena. Now that's something we could still debate today, but I think it's interesting uh, to note those differences. Basically, and uh, what we see most is that they wanted to raise women morally, socially, industrially, they wanted to help other women, particularly uh, working women. They set up courtroom watches and they would go along perhaps to somewhere where um, there was a, had been an incident of domestic violence. Uh, the one I read most was you know, a man jumping up and down and his wife who was kind of given a rap over the knuckles uh, by the magistrate. So they were, you know, they were saying that these were issues that needed to be addressed. And if there were women in the legislature, they would be able to change this. Um, also, of course, they were concerned with uh, the whole issue of sweated labour, uh, particularly in Belfast, and wanted to make women feel responsible for their own destinies, for those of their children, and for their sex as a whole. And again, there were differences. There were those who felt that there had to be property qualifications for women as there was for men, and there were those who were more radical. 
they, um, oh yeah, so they met in various societies, uh, formed right throughout Ireland and indeed uh, throughout Ulster. Um, but their methods in this early period were marching, uh, lobbying, petitioning, heckling and so forth. So peaceful methods. There's a whole other story to be told about Isabella Todd, liberal unionist as she was and as too um, was Margaret Byers and they were supported by actually a couple of labour unionists. Uh, after the, when the first Home Rule Bill uh, was introduced, um, Isabella Todd was very much against it and indeed fell out with many of her suffragist uh, colleagues. But she died um, not long afterwards, great loss to the suffrage movement. And the next generation of suffragists who kept on, you know, um, pushing at this closed door um, were, I think, of a different nature, were more likely to be a part of this growing, educated uh, body of women. Um, they publicised their views in the Irish Citizen newspaper, which is a great read for anybody wanting to know almost anything about this period, particularly but not only concerning women, because letters came in from all across the world and on every topic under the sun. And again, they didn't always uh, agree with each other. The paper was edited by Frank Sheehy Skeffington. Uh, the banner, for men and women equally, the rights of citizenship, for men and women equally, the duties of citizenship. And that duality, I think um, is very important. A lot of people only think of suffrage because of the images we've all had before us historically of just women chaining themselves to railings or throwing themselves under horses. And of course the newspapers describe these women as hysterical and, uh, and so forth. There were very specific reasons uh, behind our campaign that I think it's important uh, to note. Um, fairness uh, and, and rationale. As Mrs. Chambers, one of the big rallies uh, in Ormond Park said, the law says by this stage women could become doctors, right? Uh, the law says a woman is quite competent to perform a surgical operation, yet not to tell the difference between Joe Devlin, Belfast Nationalist leader, and Sir Edward Carson. If it were women's work to fit the children to go into the world, it was equally important to see that the world was a fit place uh, for their children. So again, the more women progress, the less sustainable this argument becomes uh, that they can't vote. And I have to say this last point always makes me think of Mary Wollstonecraft, you know. Okay, saying, well, women are mothers first and foremost. If they are, motherhood is important. Uh, and, you know, women need to be educated uh, to fill that place. So the arguments change uh, as time go on. The wider constitutional context in which suffrage was to be granted was also, of course, significant, with important implications for future citizenship. And the tensions between gender and national aspirations were to become one, but probably the most important, factor for politicised women in this period. For the suffrage battle was fought on many fronts. While British feminists concentrated upon trying to force the Westminster government to pass a, a bill granting women the vote, Irish women were attempting to persuade the Irish party in Westminster to have provision for female suffrage in any uh, home rule bill that would come. They also wanted the Irish party to support all the bills for women's suffrage that came before Parliament. Women demanded home rule for Irish women as well as Irish men, but John Redmond, leader of the Irish party, said he would never under any circumstances support female suffrage. His second in command, John Dillon, went as far as saying it would be the end of civilization as we know it. A wee bit alarmist. Um, I've lots of cartoons in this period. I just picked out a couple. Uh, Redmond here. Uh, Hurrah for liberty. No Irish woman need apply. No votes for women by order of the new liberator. Refer referencing back to Daniel O'Connell. Neither unionist nor um, major nationalist leaders wish to upset the apple cart in any way. And it's the usual thing. Do we fight from within or from without? Do we wait till we get um, you know, more freedom for Ireland before we give the votes to women? Do we wait until we settle the Ulster question before we do it? Or do we try to do that first? 
and this is constantly debated within the pages of the uh, Irish Citizen. Um, again, just a, another cartoon uh, from the period, two degenerate looking uh, aristocrats, chappies. My dear fellow, we can't give votes to women. They are physically and mentally our inferiors. Um, so, you know, you, you can see what they're fighting against in many ways. There's a whole range of societies uh, opened up during this period. Lots of, and in every locality you would get maybe a society, suffrage society made up of teachers or actresses or something or other. Lots of small societies. Uh, but this really outlines uh, the main one, the name wrong there, of course. The North of Ireland Women's Suffrage Society became the Irish Women's Suffrage Society. That's the Belfast group, who are very important. I will change this when I go on. Uh, the Dublin Women's Suffrage Association, which we know. There were also things like the Irish Women's Reform League, the Irish Women's uh, Local Government Association, uh, and so forth. And in 1911, the Irish Women's Suffrage Federation, to give a, a voice to all of these groups, kind of umbrella movement. But this one's important. 1908 is the date when uh, Emily Pankhurst decided they'd had enough and that, not that they hadn't already been breaking windows and things, but they decided, right, uh, the time was ripe for more militant action, for a militant campaign. And in Ireland, uh, the Irish Women's Franchise League formed uh, itself into a group that would support that position, uh, going for militancy. Lots again of interesting letters going back and forward uh, between individuals in these societies with people moving to or from one, you know, I don't like this militant thing, I'm going to join a different society, and so forth. Um, but a, a, an interesting um, period. So a change of tactics for some, uh, but not all, societies. And for the leaders of the suffrage movement, the main thing was to try to unite women against uh, the big political divide uh, in the country. Um, uniting, as it says, militant, uh, sorry, nationalist and unionist, militant and non-militant, uh, to try to keep them together, which of course became increasingly more difficult because, as we know, while Home Rule had been battled back and forward uh, in terms of how the bill was going through Parliament, everyone knew that following the 1911 Act by Lloyd George, it would go through in 1912. The Lords wouldn't be able to hold it up. Uh, any longer. Uh, Mrs. Cope, uh, basically she again was writing here to apologise for not being at a meeting. She said, I write from the purely unionist point of view. It seems to me imperative that all women of whatever political party should now stand for a great principle, that no democratic government can be considered complete, which ignores not only a class, but a whole sex. And that's the message that they, the leaders, were continually uh, promoting, um, but not an easy uh, message uh, to give. Um, there were others who, who took the same position. And the Irish citizen was full of um, comments about those women who put either the nationalist movement or the unionist movement first, calling them slaves to men, instead of breaking and going their own way. So lots of debate going on uh, about that. There were those, however, and again, as tensions increased coming up to 1912, uh, those who, want, who saw uh, the possibility of home rule as opening a new dawn for Ireland, um, you know, saying let's get the Irish question settled first, uh, let's get our independence, and then uh, we'll look at the women's issue. Again, people looking uh, both ways. On the unionist side too, uh, of course both unionist and nationalist women had always supported their own um, constitutional position. But as the crisis neared, as the 1912 Home Rule Bill was passing through Parliament, the Ulster Women's Unionist Council was founded in 1911. And I agree with Diane Urquhart that it was probably the biggest, certainly the biggest female uh, organisation in Ireland at this time. This is the Ulster Hall, I think at the opening meeting uh, of the council, and you would have you know, all the aristocracy um, on the platform, 
Uh, but out in the streets, uh, you had um, women going around the back streets amongst the workers of Belfast, putting the unionist position to them uh, and ensuring their loyalty. Nancy Kingan's little book on this, um, United uh, We Stood on the Early Years of, the, of this council, is, makes absolutely great reading. Okay. Their point of view. If we remember, again, it's looking for the rationale behind how, why people go the way they go and vote the way they vote. You just remember that just a few years previously, the Pope had issued a decree stating that in a mixed marriage, all children were to be brought up Catholic. Right? That's the context uh, of this statement. Uh, by a Mrs. Whitaker of the Ulster Union's Women's Council. Home rule was essentially a women's question. It affected their lives, their homes and their families. And for that reason they affirmed their declaration to assist the men in opposing and defeating home rule. With the sanctity and happiness of home life faced with peril and their religious as well as political identity under threat, women's duty to reject a priest-governed Ireland was clear. So again, a, a different type of argument, um, saying that women's duty as, as, a, as a mother and part of the family and part of the greater unionist family uh, was first and foremost uh, to resist home rule. So this is all going on uh, at the same time. And remember too that in the background, the Ulster Volunteer Force is bringing in arms and drilling regularly, and then the Irish Volunteer Force doing the same. So there's that rising tension um, throughout Ulster in particular uh, as things move forward. And this is where we see the change in tactics uh, by the Irish uh, mo franchise movement. Now, some Irish women had already engaged um, in militant tactics. This is 1911. Uh, I don't know which one's which, but we have here Dr. Elizabeth Bell, who's one of the first group uh, of women to get a proper medical degree, as opposed to a certificate, which many women medics got in that period. Um, very interesting, fascinating woman. But here she is uh, with... Her name escaped me just for a second from Whitehead, Mrs. Robinson, uh, Margaret Robinson from Whitehead. Um, and interestingly, those of you who are interested, Whitehead Suffrage Society is currently being reenacted. They're having a big day, I think it's this Saturday, where they've, they've been doing wonderful research uh, on the area um, and they're having a big day on Saturday. Um, here they are, they um, had broken the windows in Swanson and Edgar. Uh, in London and spent time in Hollywell uh, for their trouble. And again, there was lots of coming and going between the WSPU and uh, both Dublin and Belfast and other parts uh, of the island. Um, it was hard for them, mind you, uh, to get taken too seriously. Uh, in 1912, uh, I think it was, um, Yes, uh, November 1912, uh, it's not, it's June 1912, excuse me, um, where members of the uh, Irish Women's Franchise League broke the windows of um, Dublin Castle. Uh, Mary had a little bag and then it was a hammer. For Mary was a suffragette, for both she used to clamour. She broke a pane of glass one day like any naughty boy. A constable came along, and now she's in my joy. And this mocking of, of middle class women, very common um, in this period. Um, at this time, we began to see other acts of militancy in Belfast, with windows being broken in the post office uh, in Donegal Square, and so forth. The suffrage campaign received very little support from the general public, although they were very loud and fairly assertive. They were nonetheless uh, a minority group, and mostly they were mocked by the public, even before militancy, which made all of that worse. Uh, Margaret McCubrey, who I've made great use of the records here uh, in the public record office to follow the career of one of these suffragists, uh, Margaret McCubrey, whose daughter wrote uh, memoirs about her mother, 
and she talked about how coming home from school the other kids would uh, mock her. My ma is a suffragette, she wears collarette, marching up and down with her bloomers hanging down. My ma is a suffragette. She said that the mention of bloomers was what she found most um, embarrassing. But you, you get that mockery everywhere, and there are lots of other examples which I won't go into now. And we see uh, an upsurge of militant uh, activities. Um, telephone lines, uh, pillar boxes and so forth being attacked. But it was Carson's uh, party which really um, set the cat among the pigeons in many ways with Dawson Bates, uh, a senior unionist, suggesting that uh, you know there was this notion of separating out uh, part of the North East um, to exclude themselves from the Home Rule Bill and if they did that they'd give women the vote. Well, you can imagine the excitement that greeted that announcement. Um, not so much from nationalist-minded uh, women, uh, mind you, uh, but in particular, the WSPU uh, in London thought that this was the opportunity. Um, that if part of, the, uh, of Britain was going to get the vote, then they should concentrate all their efforts there. So this resulted in people, um, Dorothy Evans was the uh, organising secretary who really was most, from the WSPU, most involved, involved in Belfast and she would follow Carson around until she got him to say that no, uh, actually he wouldn't even consider giving women the vote in any new constitutional arrangement, at which point um, the suffragists in Belfast, uh, together with the WSPU, declared war on unionism. Uh, and basically, the WSPU opened its own centre in Belfast, based around the Belfast Society, and indeed the Belfast Society became a branch of the WSPU uh, in that period. Um, this was not uh, very pleasing to women nationalists who felt that uh, the involvement of the sort of alien English in this parliament that they didn't agree with uh, were involved. Again, leaders trying, like Hannah Sheehy Skeckington, trying to keep things together, but tensions constantly uh, being raised uh, as events go on. It's probably one of the, the biggest attacks of the period, an arson attack on Abbeyland's mansion in White Abbey. Uh, which caused about twenty thousand uh, pounds of damage, so it angered ratepayers even more. The stories of uh, two um, women being attacked up in the Antrim coast uh, because the locals thought they were suffragists because they were very middle class and walking up and down. Uh, they were in fact tourists, American tourists, I think. Uh, but there was a lot of anger uh, about suffrage activities at this period. Um, after the Abbeyland's attack, uh, explosives were found in Dorothy Evans' flat and she and a couple of Scottish women as well uh, were arrested. The courtroom scenes are worth reading about. If you go to the, um, uh, the newspapers of the period, I'm not going to detail, I'm conscious of the time. There was a great deal of uh, throwing of handbags, shouting, yelling, a refusal to recognise the authority of those who would not see women as citizens. Uh, so there's all, you know, that's a whole story in itself. And in fact, the local theatre group here, Kabosh, do a great telling of, of that story. They particularly, uh, I'll not go through this now, this is another nice little bit from the memoirs of Margaret McCoubrey's daughter, who talks about the Carlton uh, Cafe, where um, they used to use the hat boxes, the black and white hat boxes, to carry fire lighters in and how they were um, uh, put under surveillance and so forth uh, by the police, just kind of lighter note there. This is Lillian Metke of Lisburn Suffrage Society, um, who uh, planted, with others, planted, uh, say it was a bomb uh, in Lisburn Cathedral. They actually just broke a window, it was a nice old stained glass window, but nonetheless, she was arrested and kind of attacked by the mob. Police protection wasn't as great as it should be. But here we see again courtroom scene after courtroom scene, bedlam going on, women in prison, the cat and mouse act being introduced, uh, all of that going on at a time when you know the home rule crisis is getting ever nearer. And the point made by these women was that they were arrested and thrown into prison uh, for breaking windows and such, 
uh, and men were going around threatening civil war, bringing in guns, drilling, and so forth. So they, you know, were putting that uh, before the public. The war, of course, broke out uh, at this stage, uh, and the uh, Pankhurst, well, Emmeline Pankhurst, immediately called a truce and became one of the most ardent and patriotic supporters of the war. Um, some others did also. Um, uh, Elizabeth Bell, uh, you know, joined the medical force in um, in Malta. Uh, Dora Malone from Newry decided that you should put suffrage on hold while they did essential war relief work. Margaret McCubrey in Belfast tried to keep the suffrage movement going, and indeed she joined the Glasgow Women's Peace Crusade um, and was chased out of Bangor. Uh, an angry crowd uh, for her troubles, uh, but women responded in various different ways uh, when, uh, the, when the war broke out. I have followed many of these individuals right through uh, the period, Margaret McCubrey goes right up to the 1950s, and most, if not all of them, uh, did continue in various ways working for women uh, in, you know, in many different aspects of their life. Of course, they got the vote uh, in 1918, as we know. Um, the age um, discrimination, if you like, or the age different, designed to ensure that there weren't more women than men uh, voting at that time. Um, it did extend the franchise. Uh, two women stood in the 1918 election. Uh, Countess Markievicz, who won uh, her Dublin seat, but cons uh, subsequently uh, uh, joined the Doyle as a Sinn Féin member. Winifred Carney stood as a Republican Socialist uh, in North Belfast and was shamefully ignored, I think, by uh, other nationalist um, politicians in the area and uh, only got a very few votes uh, indeed. Uh, of course, we know then that in the Free State, uh, when it was founded in 1922, uh, men and women over 21 were granted the vote, while in Britain and Northern Ireland they had to wait until 1928. Thank you very much. <laughs>
comic book we did back in, in 2014 was the, the, these first two, the Easter Rising and the Battle of the Saw, and they're printed back to back in the one publication. Uh, and that lady on the left, the text is quite small, but that's one for Kearney, and it tells one of Kearney's story through the Easter Rising, uh, and what she was subsequently went on to be involved in. Uh, on, on the flip side of that, on the reverse of that, you get the story of Billy McFadden, uh, the BC winner uh, from Lurgan and subsequently Belfast. Uh, so it's about trying to open up dual perspectives and dual stories and presenting those uh, in, in a new way uh, so that people, um, I say young people, uh, I show these to my, my parents and uh, my family who are all you know, 50, 60, 70 plus as well, they get a benefit out of reading these stories as well uh, and it helps them understand things in new ways too. So we've also done some stories around the Sinking of Lusitania, uh, we had a flip side comic book on Alice Milligan with Francis Ledwich, uh, then more recently around the Battle of the Scene. Um, paired with the story of Kathleen Lynn. Uh, so always looking at, at, at different perspectives, always looking at both male and female stories. Uh, but then this year, uh, working with Prony, we developed a new comic book, a new graphic novel, which looks at these two uh, important characters in the context of 1918, uh, and in the context of suffrage, uh, and the suffrage movement, and, and various campaigns that were going on at that time. Uh, I never leave home without any. Uh, there's always at least 3,000 in my car, in my boot, in the back seat, sort of rolling about. I probably really like to get some copies. I'll come around and give them a chance in a wee second. Uh, so we produced this new comic book, which on one side you get the story of Prentice Markovich, on the other side you get the story of Edith, Lady Londonderry. And again, that's about printing both of those stories back to back, so that somebody who's heard this story but hasn't heard this one, or vice versa, gets this in their hand and gets a chance to see it in a way that they wouldn't otherwise have. They're quite short stories, so it's usually 8, eight to 12 pages in length. They try and tease out some of the kind of key messages and key things these characters might have been involved in. So in the story of Lady well, Londonderry, for example, it, it, all the way through from her kind of socialist or so, socialite background, socialist background, um, through uh, her involvement with the Women's Legion during the First World War. Uh, and then it was just also in partnership with Mount Stewart, so it looks at her connections to the Mount Stewart as well. The Countess Margaret's story again tells her story all the way through from early days, um, her, her kind of social and political background as a, as a young person, through your involvement in Easter Rising and standing as an MP for the first time as well. What we've also always done with these comic books and these graphic novels is link, uh, link them to the curriculum uh, for education use in Northern Ireland. So you can see along the bottom it says that the key stage three learning resources. And that's a way of being able to embed these into the classroom so that young people again uh, and schools can get access to these and schools can see the benefits of, of teaching us in the classroom uh, and allowing young people to hear these new stories. Uh, and again, thanks to the, this project that we're doing this year with Prony, uh, we've been able to, to print loads of these comic books. And every single secondary school in Northern Ireland has got a pack of these sent out to them, as well as copies of all of these comic books as well, which also feature kind of important uh, female characters. So we're always we're trying to open up new perspectives and new, and new stories, uh, and giving new voice to these people. And I said this here for now, I will, I will pass out some out afterwards, if anybody would like to get them. Uh, as well as that, what we've also done what we also do, I'll just turn this down a little bit and play it. Um, we produced a, a suite of animations and interactive kind of video content. And I'll flick through this a little bit, you know, get past the introduction. <coughs> this is an animation that looks and tries to tell the whole of the suffrage movement in I think it's about five and a half minutes. Uh, now Myrtle stood up and tried to do it in, in half an hour earlier and struggled, so you can imagine how much we struggled for five minutes. Uh, but again, it tries to tease out some of the main stories, but what we're always trying to do with, with our comic books, with our animations, with all of this content, is taking all of that rich archive uh, content, the rich archive, archive collections that Prony have here, that all the kind of heritage bodies have, and present it in a way that people can access and, 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 and digest quite quickly. So you're not going to learn absolutely everything about the suffrage movement in five minutes, because you'll get an understanding of some of the key people, of some of the key stories, some of the key locations. And what we do with this as well is, um, I was at the talk on, on Tuesday night and someone was talking about um, writing about this time frame and writing novels about this time frame. And one of the tasks she always does at the very start of each of the workshops is get people to close their eyes and try to imagine what life was like 100 years ago. And 9.9 .9 times out of 10, um, the colours that always come forward are black and white, everybody kind of imagines the past in black and white. And we're quite conscious of that, so we're taking all of this archive imagery, which is black and white, adding a degree of colour to it, again to try and, and lift them to a new dimension. Uh, we also use a method of uh, digital projection called 2.5D parallax, 
which is just a really fancy way of saying we pull out some of the images into like a 3D format. Again, to try and make it look like it's more, more lively and it's like an actual moving thing. That these people are all uh, come to life in a way. So this one we've, we've, we've produced this year. We've also produced these animations around important events like the Easter Rising, Path of the Song, Path of the Scene, uh, all of which are available online. Uh, and the beauty of these uh, resources and these animations, for example, is that they're a good intro, intro point uh, to a conference or to an event or to a workshop or to a classroom. Uh, not so Stuart Myrtle uh, giving her talk, which is fantastic. But it's I'll just do little, this instead. You can just do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good little entry point to allow people to kind of get a perspective of what you're talking about. I'll not play through the whole thing, uh, because 5.5 minutes when I'm standing watching takes a lot longer than you think. Uh, what we've also done this year is to try and tease some of these stories out in different ways. So these two characters in the middle here, on the left is uh, Edith, Lady Londonderry, and on the right is Countess Markovic. And we worked with Kibosh, she worked with before as well, fantastic theatre company based in Belfast. Um, and we developed a short 15, 20 minute piece, a fictional meeting between both of these characters, which we then toured around 10 different schools across Derry and Belfast. Uh, as a way to launch these new resources, the animation, the comic book, but again also to give young people an understanding, uh, almost like, like hearing these stories from, from the, the mouths of people who were involved. Uh, but it is a fictional meeting, we're, not, we're pretty sure these people probably never met, uh, so there's a little bit of creative, creative license with it, but again it's a way of, uh, of opening up a little bit more discussion around all of these events. Uh, and then what we do with that is that we're able to go into schools, we're able to go into community settings, and the Nerve Centre, as uh, I mentioned before, we're, we're a creative multimedia space and all of our work is around using digital um, creativity to engage whether it's young people uh, or older groups around issues of the past. So, for example, the kinds of things we can do and the kinds of things we do do and have been doing this year specifically are you know, working with, with uh, youth groups to create their own digital comic book stories about the past using green screen technology to put people uh, back in time, send themselves back in time to those events. There's a little snippet of a film up here on the right hand side where a group of young, uh, young boys and girls were learning about 1918 and the suffrage movement and decided to make a short film about uh, Countess Markovich. So this is Countess Markovich uh, in the hat uh, and it's a short kind of retelling of, of her and the kind of things that she was involved in and the kind of obstacles that, that she faced. And these young people were able to add their own spin to that uh, and, and to tell the story about, about Countess Markovich that they wanted to tell. Ignore the fake moustaches. Uh, <laughs> we always have fake moustaches and that seems to be the first thing to, to go uh, or to be used. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a 100% you know, accurate retelling where every single fact and every single word that they say is what might have been said. It's a chance for them to be creative and to open up and to imagine what might have happened at that time. So again, we always find, or we have found certainly through these projects, the creativity, the digital technologies are a great way and a great hook for uh, well, certainly young people in the first instance, but people of all ages to, to, to engage with this content uh, and to have their own say, say in it as well, whereas, which is where the creative and the creative theory comes about. Uh, all of this content is online, and I'll show you my email address at the end if anybody would like to, to get in touch. The, the most, or one of the most substantial things we created this year as well was an interactive iBook, uh, which is available on the Apple iBook store for free, free download. Um, and we work quite closely with Prony. So Prony had a resource a few years ago called Stamp Up Be Counted. Um, so we've taken that paper-based content, or that, that was archived content from, from a few years ago, and tried to represent it uh, as a digital interactive resource for the classroom. And again, trying to link it into the curriculum uh, where possible, but it's a, it's, a, it's a resource that anybody can pick up and use. And I'll scan through it quite quickly. So, um, so well, if I can zoom out a little bit, first of all. So it's broken down into a few different sections. I'm using this on the laptop today. When you see it on the iPad, it, it presents itself in much the same way. So there's an introduction. There's a suffrage timeline, which broadly breaks down uh, the kind of key events and key uh, happenings from that period. And by clicking on all of these, all the way throughout this, this resource, it's meant to be as interactive as possible, so that you're always trying to find hidden information. So you can find a lot of it as Isabel Todd here, for example, uh, all the way through from 1832, um, to 1928, and you know, assuming this still goes on today. So all of this content, even the cat and mouse hack, for example, is trying to again break down into little kind of snippets and bits of pieces of information. So as well as the timeline, it's broadly broken down into what we call these two chapters: so suffrage and political perspectives, and then suffrage and society. I won't go through every single page, but I'll show you some of the examples of how it's presented. So again, 
probably holds a wealth of content, as Myrtle has said before, about this time frame and about some of the kind of key characters and things that happened. So we wanted to be able to present that in a way that, that young people, teachers could then sort of use and embed in the classroom. So all the way throughout this, this little section, for example, it, it sort of sets up um, Europe and Ireland uh, in the 19th century, so pre these events and what was going on. All of the imagery is all clickable and scalable, so we can actually start zooming in and examining different pieces of content. Um, for example, you actually appear in some of these videos. Uh, you may, may be surprised to learn, I would not. Um, so there's video content embedded through it as well. Uh, and this is courtesy of the Community, Community Relations Council who filmed uh, a lecture series a few years ago. Um, so again, being able just to embed that into a resource that can then be picked up and used uh, to kind of uh, offer little snippets of information. These little videos last about two, three, four months in some instances, but give a little bit more perspective about suffrage and home rule than maybe 10 paragraphs of text might. Uh, and again, all the way throughout, the Peroni's rich archive content is embedded in here, so you can actually start to access it. Uh, and we've, we've, we've taken selections of that content, there's obviously there's a wealth of content out there. So all of these resources can all be clickable, or all clickable, and all scalable, so you can actually zoom in and start to examine this in a lot more detail. Throughout it as well, we've also, let me just go back out, back in. Um, so across the bottom, um, where possible, we've always also tried to add in some, some questions and activities uh, and exercises that can be done in the classroom as well uh, to kind of bring that to life a little bit more too. Um, again, there are little clickable points all the way through, so some research tasks that have been set. Just a way of presenting this imagery in a different way. Uh, I'll quickly scan through, so as well as that, there's some text which is highlighted and which can be brought up. Uh, again, it's just about trying to make it a, a, more of a, a, an immersive experience. Uh, so that anybody can uh, sort of find out a little bit more information about this time frame. And as I said, it's broken down into that chapter, which is Suffrage and Political Perspectives, which has all of these kind of mini sections within it. The next chapter then is Suffrage Society. And again, that's looking in the same kind of format as before. You can see that these pages across the bottom are broken down in the same kind of format. Um, and representing that information in that same way as well. Um, there's a little about section at the end. I'm kind of uh, going to wrap up by saying that's my email address. If anybody would like to access any of these resources, uh, they're all free. They're all most of them are all available online. That iBook can be done for free from the Apple iBook Store. We have comic copies of the comic book, uh, which can be accessed uh, by anybody who needs them. Uh, as I said, we did send them to all schools. Most libraries have them across all libraries and online venues. Uh, we tend to make them as freely available as possible. The animations are all available online too. But you feel free to uh, drop me an email and I'd like to point in directing about anything else you might need. Just to say that it's, it's, it's a great, um, we love working with Prony. We love working with an archive body like, like this because the content's there uh, and it's, it's such an exciting way for us to be able to take that content and present it in new and exciting ways. And uh, so that's what we love to be able to do. So thank you for listening. I hope that was beneficial. I hope that some of those resources might be beneficial too. I come around and pass it. Good afternoon everyone. So just a little interlude, no longer than six hours, and just looking at a few of the voices from the archives themselves. I had the privilege of the first six months of this year to work directly with the Prony sources um, to produce an exhibition, Voices and Votes, which if you haven't already seen, it's on tour around NI and indeed in Denmark as well. And I encourage you to seek it out. It's currently in the Neary City Library. So up here, Yes. Um, and I encourage you to have a look. But I've just a few minutes um, to draw out a few voices. I'm just going to throw the voices out there directly from the sources and pose a few questions for you to, to think about. Now, I'd like to specifically start with uh, a key source on the election day itself. Um, and then pose the questions. So the first source really that I'm going to talk about is a letter um, from the Presbyterian Minister and Home Rule supporter James Brown Armour commenting to his wife in a letter on the 17th of December 2018 as observations and then we'll think around um, this letter with a few other voices um, from the archives. So he writes in December 1918, no election in my memory was ever so quiet as was Saturday's. A few excited females, 
Mrs. McEldry, the Boyds, and Mrs. Stewart, and the Pattersons. A number of dafties were out hailing men and women into the Tory camp. Little interest was taken in it in most places, but women were to the fore in some districts. So there you have comments that the election was quiet. Um, the combined effort of men and women for the first time, and indeed women to the fore in some districts. So all Armour's um, comments are one of only a few that I can find in, in um, the actual archive relating to private views on 1918 election day. So he conveys to his wife basically how quiet it was, um, how little interest in most places, but there in the letter is the participation of women. So the first question really drawing from that letter is how significant was this change in women's representation basically. Um, and indeed the representation of the People Act 1918 or the Fourth Reform Act is regarded today as the most radical change to the electoral system in the UK since the Act's appearance in 1832 as women over the age of 30 received the parliamentary vote for the first time um, if they were either a member or married to a member of the local government register or a property owner. And I'd like to draw upon the words of four distinct individuals represented in the Prony Archive to help us reflect on the experience of, of women before these legislative changes were approved basically for us to think about, and I'm giving no answers at all, it's for you to think about, um, according to the words that have been unlocked from the archive. So the first question is, how were women's rights represented before election day on the 14th of December 1918? So to use the exact words, but I'd be keen to hear your personal thoughts um, afterwards, or indeed after the event. So you can see here, I've just listed the voices that I'm going to refer to, and I'm just going to use their exact words. The first voice is Mabel Small, suffragette, um, based in Belfast, and of course, suffragettes were women who sought the right to vote through militant action, including organised protests, interrupting political right meetings, and attacking buildings. Mabel Small had a loud and public voice. Um, as an active suffragette in Belfast. And a newspaper article regarding an attack on the Old Town Hall in Belfast in 1914 states, and this is the words, a young woman named Mabel Small appeared in the dock wearing a green costume and carrying a bunch of daffodils. She is accused of maliciously damaging the window. During her hearing, the newspaper says that she called out did you find anything on me? In response, the arresting constable replied in the proceedings, in your bag were three or four half bricks. So that was good enough um, evidence. From the Prony perspective, there's three letters from a file created by our employer here within the archives. Our employer, the Belfast College of Technology, now um, Belfast Metropolitan College. And they reveal the confidence in which she spoke specifically. So to the principal in April 16th, 1914, she writes, As you will probably have seen an account in the papers of my arrest and imprisonment, I beg to inform you that after four days hunger and thirst strike, I have been released under the Cat and Mouse Act and shall be at my duties at the Technical Institute on Monday as usual. <coughs> In acknowledgement, a letter was sent out from the Technical Institute, and this is what they replied. I put it to you that it is an understanding in this place that everyone is required to abstain from propaganda work and give their whole energy to the work of the Institute. As far as possible, staff are expected to use the holidays for regeneration of their efforts so that they may return to their work with full vigour. Again, due to her loud voice and with valour, she sends a further letter to her employer 
on the 24th of June. And this is a, a short um, few sentences from it. As we are nearing the end of the term, the next week will be the last day of June. I am writing to remind you that my promise to refrain from militancy applied only to the term and that I reserve the right to do as I pleased with my holidays. So a very assertive voice from the archives. But there was mass resistance to the suffragettes approach and a few letters really pay significance to that from the collections here at Crony. Writing to his mother on the 5th of June 1913, Cam Alexander, army officer, notes, we went over to see the Derby. There was a bad scene when the wretched suffragette caught the king's horse and nearly killed his jockey. I wish the woman had been given to the crowd. It would have stopped suffragettes. She is badly hurt. I enjoyed the day awfully. Of course, he was referring to Emily Davison, who later died of her injuries. And writing in 1914, a civil servant, Schomburg MacDonald, suggests a novel approach in dealing with militant women. And this is where you can start heckling. <laughs> um, suffragettes continue to rage furiously. I hope in time they will see how foolish and revolting their behaviour is. Moreover, it is calculated to set people against the cause which they advocate. I should like to marry them by force to strong men who would keep them in order. Can't find the words. <laughs> <laughs> at least no one's throwing anything at me. The second voice, which is abstractly presented to you, um, is Agnes Sunley, suffragist. And of course, suffragists believe their goals could be achieved using peaceful means, non-violent demonstrations, petitions, publications, and the lobbying of MPs. She had written quite extensively across UK and Ireland to, to certain individuals. And in the collections here, a letter to the Lord Chancellor of Ireland as early as 1884, where she called for any future reforms to be extended to women as, and this is her words, women are entirely unrepresented, not one woman being allowed to vote although they discharge the same duty to the state. I know many women who are working very hard to get a living for themselves and their children and pay just the same amount of rates and taxes as men and yet they are not considered good enough to vote. The third voice is that of J.S. Mill, John Stuart Mill, feminist writer, later MP for the city of Westminster. And indeed, he was elected on a platform, including votes for women, around the 1860s. His thinking on women's rights were influenced by his wife, Harriet Taylor Mill. He published an essay, The Subjection of Women, in opposition to established opinions, such as those of the Reverend John Gregg, in 1856 stating that society does best when each sex performs the duties for which it is especially ordained. A, copies of, a copy of Mill's essay can be found amongst the papers of Jeremiah Jordan MP where a number of key statements can unfold his case for <coughs> perfect equality, a nice concept. He writes, the legal subordination of one sex to another is wrong in itself and now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement, and that it ought to be replaced by a system of perfect equality, admitting no power and privilege on the one side, nor disability on the other. There remains no legal slaves, save the mistress of every house. Although Mill's arguments were well received, traditional views still won out, and in 1884, Sir Joseph Peace presented that women is endowed with a most delicate organization which sways the whole course of her life. It influences her actions and her mode of thought and in effect is to keep and make mankind afford her protection rather than turn her adrift in the vortex of political life. The final, the fourth voice I want to to present to you before posing the questions is that of Marianne McCann, 
a workhouse inmate, and indeed Board of Guardians or workhouse records are one of the few sources that offer an insight into the experiences of some of the poorest people in Victorian society, including women under the male authority. In 1865, Marianne was admitted to the Belfast workhouse five times with her two young daughters, each time remaining for several days. In total, they spent 25 out of 31. Workhouse officials recorded Marianne's occupation as prostitute. Her voice does not survive in the archive, however, evidence of her experiences are reflected in as little as six lines of a register. The Minute Book of Ballymena Border Guardians make known the experience of such a silenced voice in the workhouse. By 1848, it was resolved that, this is from the Minute Book, females admitted labouring under venereal disease, common prostitutes, or women who have each more than one bastard child be separately classed in the ward over the idiot ward. Inmates of this ward are not to go into the dining hall at meals, not to attend divine service, but to be supplied with prayer books and testaments. Although women considered to be prostitutes used the workhouse as a place of refuge and respite, many lower working class women who had no obvious occupation or who had illegitimate children were classed as prostitutes by the workhouse authorities. Of course, there's no evidence in the archive that Marianne was an active prostitute. However, the prostitute label would transform her experience, whether inside or outside of the workhouse. So ladies, women such as Marianne, had a champion in suffragists such as Isabella Todd, already mentioned by Myrtle, and indeed a very prominent uh, feminist in this part of the world. She, in 1871, established the Belfast branch of the Ladies' National Association to repeal the Contagious Diseases Acts. Under these acts, suspected prostitutes like Marianne could be arrested and forcibly examined. But through her work and other suffragists, by 1886, with their campaigning, the acts were repealed. So, I'd like to go back to the question after presenting the voices. And I'd like just to ask, how were women's rights represented before election day on the 14th of December, 1918? I believe voices from the Prony Archive reveal something of the experiences of women and the advocacy of men during the 96 year struggle for equal franchise and remain in the archive to be heard today. John Stuart Mill published feminist commentary on women and the vote, arguing that having half the human race unable to contribute to society outside the home was a hindrance to human development. Working class women such as Marianne were silenced with official labels until suffragists such as Isabella Todd actively campaigned against, and this is what she said in 1878, the men who devised such legislation. Marianne's personal experiences can be revealed a hundred years on. And suffragettes such as Mabel Small had a militant approach to campaign for change in women's representation. However, like 60% of local women in 1918, Mabel was not permitted to cast her vote. So I'd like to end with two questions. I'm sure you're glad that I'm ending. And just to take away with you this afternoon, in his correspondence to his wife, Armour reflected that the 1918 general election was quiet, with little interest taken in most places. But how significant would the 1918 election day have been for those men and women who were experiencing the right to express a democratic voice at parliamentary level for the first time? And secondly, to what extent did changes in 1918 particularly in women's representation, meet the needs and aspirations of those voices that we've heard from the archive this afternoon. Marianne and working class women, campaigners like J.S. Mill and Agnes Sunley, 
and passionate activists such as Mabel Small. So thank you very much for listening. quick run through what the action voter lists are and what they look like, what's in them, then Janet is going to demonstrate them. Uh, she's doing that job because, I'm, well, I'm, I'm confident that, 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 that the application is going to be available. Yes. Yes. Uh, which part will cross your fingers? No, cross your fingers. So the action voter list of 1918, um, we've probably heard a lot about the 19, 1918 Representation of People Act. Uh, it covers the main groups of people. It extends the right to vote to, to, to nearly all men. It extends the right to women over the age of 30, subject to various property qualifications or marriage qualifications. Uh, a third group which was included in it was an attempt to make sure that the soldiers who were involved in fighting the war got a voice as, a, 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 as well. Uh, you know, the, the election is held in December 1918, right at the end of the war, just a, a few weeks after the armistice. You have still a large number of, of people actually in the armed forces, probably more than 4 million uh, of the UK. A lot of them are away from home. There's, still, there's a large force still in France and abroad in the other theatres of, of conflict. So there's two things. One is to make sure that they're registered and able to vote. The other thing was to find a mechanism by which they actually could vote. Uh, so the, the, the Act does do that. It, it attempts to come up with a system of, to say, register these people who are serving, uh, make sure they're registered in the proper constituency, and find a way that they can vote either by an absentee ballot, by, by what you might call a postal ballot, or by a proxy where you nominate somebody to vote and vote for you. So as I said, uh, the Act is, to make, is basically aimed at these guys, the people who are serving. The Army, the Navy and the Air Force, but also in auxiliary formations, uh, Red Cross and a various other organizations related to, to the, uh, the actual operation of, of the war. Uh, one of the concessions they made the, was to bring down the age of registration down to 19. I've said from age 19, 19 hour, I just noticed, I suppose, after we doing this presentation in a hurry, they, they were able to register from the age of 19 rather than 21. So a ninth, the reason for 19 is that's the age where you're able to go abroad on active service. So you would actually be fighting more from the age of 19. So it's ensuring the men, all the men who were fighting the war, could get a, a vote. So it was covering these guys. It's not covering these guys so much. Um, women, uh, it's women over 30 who are qualified through a, through a property qualification or through marriage or through a resident qualification. So it does restrict the number of women who can actually vote quite, quite considerably. They don't extend that concession of bringing the age down to 19 to women. It is still women over 30. Uh, so a lot of the women who want to actually uh, serve during the war, they didn't serve in the armed forces per se. They didn't. They still work. They're still looking at doing them actually fighting during the First World War. But they're involved in lots of auxiliary organisations, including nursing and the Sunbury. Uh, dangerous positions, these three, three women are in Serbia, and that photograph was, was taken or somewhere on the border between Serbia and Macedonia, at the Scottish Women's Hospital. But if they're under 30, which they appear to be, they would not be allowed to vote, so they, their name is not going to be on these lists. We have option voter lists for two counties. I should say there was a main register of voters set up on a separate list of the absent voters. These are the military and navy voters who are not actually in residence at the time of the election. So there are separate absent voters. lists. We'll show you in a minute set up for these. We have them for two counties, uh, County of Derry, Londonderry, and County of Armagh. Each of those has three constituencies in 1918. So you've got uh, Londonderry City, North Londonderry, South Londonderry, and North Mid and South Ar Armagh. So just, just to make a point, because usually when you talk about a resource for such and such a county in that area, the first question you get is, what about some other county? So unfortunately, it is just those two counties. But that does give you 88,000 names uh, uh, between these two counties. Um, so we have the list for that, and those are what are going to be available online. That's a breakdown of the uh, percentages by the constituencies. There is an interesting diversion in the number of people who are registered in these options, this between 
Consistency. Um, I mean, overall in the UK, you have something like f just under 4 million people, and it comes to 32% of the male uh, electorate over the UK and, and as a whole is, is in these absent voter lists, which is a remarkable testimony to the extent of, of <coughs> organisation of the British population towards the end of the war. In Ireland, you have 100,000. Uh, registered absent voters, who are mainly military voters, that's 9% of the male uh, electorate. So that's still quite considerable. But within the constituency, it varies. Some of the Belfast constituencies is up to 20% of the, of, of the male voters are absent voters. In some rural areas, you can go down to 3 or 4%. You see the spread there uh, across the counties. Armagh North, which includes Lurgan and Portadown, Down, is 10%. Mid Armagh, which includes Armagh City, 5%, down to 3% in. South Armagh, Londonderry City, very high, nearly 14%. Down to 6% in North Armagh, which would include Korean and the Valley, again down to 3% in South Derry. So the reasons for the discrepancy, I think you have much higher recruitment and much higher engagement in the armed services in urban areas. And I think that's what you're seeing there. There may be additional layer of much higher um, uh, registration in in Eunice Road and Dundee Nationalist areas, but that's not quite so clear cut. Oxley, South Armagh, Dundee Nationalist area, which returned to Sinn Féin MP in 1918, fairly low. Mid and North Armagh returned Unionist. The problem with that analysis is it's not very city, it's the highest there, and it also returned to Sinn Féin uh, MP, which is sort of referential majority, I think it's 51%, 49%. There's actually, I think there's a slight anomaly in London, you said you think it would repay for other considerations. It seems to be, a, to be an anomaly high number in London, you said, so we're doing this at the new, and it's an analysis of whose names and see what's actually going on there. So what do you have for each county? There was a register of voters done for the whole constituency, which includes everybody, okay, that's entitled to vote, men and women, in one register. And there is a separate document called the list of absent voters. Uh, so that, Again, there's a lot of confusion about this. So you have a register, which is like the registers that, that you get now, you're probably familiar with, uh, for for elections, printed register for everybody, and they say there's a list of absent voters. Uh, that's what the main register looks like. So you'll have a name in the main register. So uh, you see the guy at the top there I've taken, uh, just at random, down on the bottom there, we've got William Locke. And you'll see there's a lowercase a beside this number there, that means he's absent. And his parliamentary qualification is NAM. That means he qualifies as a military voter. He qualifies for the vote. Even if he's qualified in other ways, even if he's a household or any or resume any other way, but he's qualifying primarily that he's a military voter, he's in the armed forces or in, a, in, in some similar occupation. So that's his qualification. So he's in the main register <coughs> in his area. But it also appears in the second <coughs> document, which is the list of absent voters for the constituency. And um, there he is again. And when you go in there, William Locke, Van Lahr, that tells you he's a lieutenant in the Royal Institute of Fusil Years. Now, this is the interesting information from, from my point of view or from my perspective, because what these lists are telling you is not just a number of your vote, it's telling you where they're serving, what their unit is. So for the military historians, and there's one or two in the audience, this is where you get down to the really nerdy, interesting stuff. You can look at the pattern of service, what units they're serving in, how many of them are officers, what battalions they're going into, all of that detail. And also from a geological point of view, that's very useful piece of information if you want to do further research on these people. Having particularly the service number, officers don't have service numbers, but for the ordinary soldiers, their service number, that's a very, very useful to try and do any Research. So that if you look at the guy before, the little William Locke down the Orton, you could his number of 3856 Private 13th East Lancashire Regiment. If you're going to do any further research on him, what he did during the war, that's the information that you need to start with. There are other um, people in these lists that you might not expect because these lists are compiled, the action photos list is compiled during 1918. They start work immediately after the acts passed in February 18. And it's being compiled during March uh, through, through June 1918. They're published in September 18 while the war is still going on. Now they do record changes during that period. But so for instance, there's a couple of guys there are marked who are prisoners of war. Um, and there's also ones that are marked as being killed. So if you look at this guy, Best Clark, um, 
he's down in the list, but in brackets after uh, Private Second World Irish Fusiliers Prisoner of War. So he must have been taken prisoner probably in March 1918 during the big German offensives, where a lot of the uh, Austin Division men were taken prisoner during, during, the, during the first days of that, that attack. You go in and do further research, and you have his number as to his regiment. That's his medal card. Anybody who's done any research on, uh, on the history of service during the First World War in the East. So you're going to get his medal card. And you can see his service. He served with Seaforth Highlanders and the Irish Rifles uh, as, as well. So he's a guy who's not actually you know, there. I mean, he, he, was, you know, he was able to send his registration form in, but then he's taken prisoner. You've also got this guy, just David McGrath, has just put down his killed. So obviously he registered at the start of this, but they picked up later that he'd been killed in later operation. And they go to come with word of this commission and get the stuff on. David McGrath, Royal Irish Fusiliers, killed on the 16th of August, 1917. Now exactly why he managed to be killed in 1917 and still register, I do not know. Uh, that, that is a bit of a puzzle. Uh, but presumably, somebody's either he sent somebody sent a form in on, on his behalf, and it is the same David McGrath because it's the same street. Um, so I'm not quite sure why that discrepancy is there, because it didn't start registering until early 1918. Um, so you do have a lot of anomalies like like that in there. Um, I mentioned there's not many women. Uh, in that, um, in fact, one of the, I haven't done a complete analysis, but one of the states say that Armadi of over 900, after the there's only two women, I can say one point on the end of this. But occasionally you will get a few in, there's somebody, that's, somebody you may know about, Molly Best, or Kenny Monaglass, and she's down at HMHS Wandilla, that's His Majesty's Hospital Ship. Um, if you want to know more about Molly, there's a graphic novel, but don't know which one Niles are not on, on her. Uh, from uh, you can get from the Bagman Castle Museum because she left a diary for experience as, as a nurse during the war. Uh, unfortunately, the graphic novel doesn't show her voting, which is a nice. You, you get the whole story there, but as I say, not many women, it's not a good representation of women's service during the war. These registers. Um, other anomalous or strange information that you will get is you get people who are doing other things other than the military. So you have two munitions workers up there. Just to bring that up, um, so John Dines just mentioned doing munition work. Malcolm Hall, munition work, and I'll give you some more details. He's a stager working for Harmer Wolf in Govan in Glasgow. So occasionally you get that. They're also away from home, um, and they're also, this is we consider to be war related service, war related work because, because of the munitions work, so they're in there as well. Um, so that's another useful thing that you might not think about being in there. And um, yes, you will also get people. It's another strange one. That this is, that's, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. A lot of these people aren't actually resident at those addresses and haven't been for some time. I'll show you one example of that later. But notice, William McCall is he's actually with the Canadians, and William Whiteside is with the. 31st Battalion of the Australians, so they both left Ireland, going to either Canada or Australia, but they'd still registered to vote in their, in, in their own home constituency. And there's quite a few of those. You've also got guys with, with the American Army in here as well. And you can get more information on those because the Canadian and Australian records particularly are quite good and are available online, so you can get like white sides service history from the Australians and see what's going on there. Um, and the whole story of and there's actually quite a lot of mention correspondence uh, on that file about him. He actually goes back to times past after the war, after his father dies, to look after his family. So again, not something you would think about, but you know, there's people who actually aren't, haven't been resident there for some time. Um, the, the dairy records are a bit different, but we'll give you those in a minute. For Armagh, you have one set, perhaps in voter lists, printed out to voter lists for three instances. For the three dairy seats, we have the printed absent voter list. We also have a volume which was put together, we think, to update these lists later, at a later date. So as well as a guy being on the printed list, 
So the take twos of Karen is there, which gives you his detail, his service number, and he's with the ASC Motor Transport with the, with the Army Service Corps. So it just tells you that. But you can also look at um, Yeah, yes, and also look at this second source, which is this volume and compile when we're doing the update. And you'll notice that there it's marked in the corner dead. We're also going through putting an update and checking these guys. And particularly the Commonwealth War Base Commission, uh, we can work out that he died in 1919. So we're getting a layer, you're getting a second layer of information. That's why we put these volumes on as well as the registers. You're getting this later information. So this guy died in Basra. Iraq in 1919, British Army occupied uh, this after the war, and you have a low level, level insurgency going on there for you can say, the next 20 years, or the next 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so there's the, the perspective there. So it's a useful reminder, by the way, that the 19, November 1918 does not end the killing. Um, so you've got a second layer of information there. Now that is only for, for the dairy ones. Uh, the other point I was going to make from these where I got the slides out of order. Another thing you can do from these, you can do, you can look at families. Because the main lists are done by, uh, by street or by town now, you can pick out a whole family. So certainly there, you notice there's three Martins there, John, Michael and Robert, all at the same address. It's number 49, can I get that street to one street? No, one of the streets in there, but they're all in the same house. So they're all they're, they're all serving labor corps. He's probably separate, probably got engineers. He's from the Royal Irish Regiment. So all the three guys in the house are actually serving. And if you go into the 1911 census, uh, you can pick them up there. There's John, Mike, and Roberts. So out of that household, three boys all served. And there was this Catholic family from Derry, and all three sons from into the forces. So, some quite interesting stuff comes out of this point when you start the analysis, do the, the, the analysis. Um, I'll just finish by, I don't want to, uh, John's going to, we want to focus on what is there. As I said, there's some things aren't there, and there's some quite strange entries there. I picked up them already. Uh, we don't have the option for this for anything else except Armagh and Derry, so I'll just reiterate that. We do have the full register for North Down. That's the complete register. It includes the details of, of the, um, the full register would include people who are registered as military voters. And then it doesn't give that option for this with the details of where they're serving in their regiments. Just to make that clear. But on the end of pick out in there, North Down includes Cumber. On the Cumber Town Parks, you see a pretty well known name there, Edmund Wind. Uh, now that's curious for two reasons. One, he's dead, and secondly, he, did, he wasn't living in that house for a long, long time. Um, that's a lot closer. You see a lot of military voters there for, from Cumber, all right, sure together, and the one absent. He, he had actually died on the 21st of March, 1918. Now, in his case, this registration is explainable the fact that he wasn't officially posted as dead until October 1918. He was missing in action. Uh, after the attacks in, in, in March. So they did get final confirmation that he'd been killed uh, until October. So that is one reason why his name would have stayed on, on the register. The other reason, which is harder to go into, is the... We've been doing a bit of research in here. It's a sort of plug for the next application, possibly. The next resource we're working on. Done a bit of work on, on the background to, 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 to the wind. Um, we know from... He left home at least by 1911. He was living in... Um, Calvin working at the bank there. And in 1911, he emigrates to Canada, uh, where he buys a house. He, he joins the army in Canada in 1914, comes back. But why he considered to be still a voter in Cumber in 1918, when he was actually living in Canada, is a very strange, and I don't know. But one of the things I haven't looked at, there's obviously no residency qualification for this list, to some extent. You know, residency doesn't seem to mean that much. Um, I just mentioned he, he had a sister who's not as well known as him called uh, Edith Caroline. And when she also serves, uh, she went out to France in 1914, the French ambulance unit. 
later transferred to the Red Cross and is in France until late 1916 as a matron of various hospitals. Um, age was at age 45, that's not actually true, she lied about her age, went to school, made herself younger, um, and uh, served for a number of years. She is back in Cumber, we reckon, by 1918, so she came back in 1917 to nurse her sister who was dying of cancer. She's not on the list. No, she's over 30. She's not a householder. Her mother's on the list, but she isn't. So the irony is that there's a over, woman over 30 who served during the war, and George Constitution isn't. So I'll leave you with that thought. Uh, they're very, I think they're, they're going to be a very, very useful resource, both for the military historians who want to analyze units, what people were joining, uh, what the structure of recruitment is in 1918. Also, for people who want to do family history, obviously, put in the name in, see if you can get details of who served in those two counties. But also bear in mind, there's, there's, you know, there's people in there who shouldn't have been there, and there's people who shouldn't have been there who aren't. That's what I leave you with that thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to, uh, hopefully, show everyone where these actually are located on the Pony website. So to access the absent voters list, under Decade of Centenaries, uh, which you can access on the Pony homepage. Under that list, you'll see absent voters lists. And you'll get a little bit of an overview, which goes into some of the detail that Ian has just, uh, just told us outlines what is there and what isn't there. So depending on the county you're interested in, you can select. And again, you'll get a little bit more information with your Crummy referencing, a bit about what you're going to find on the website, which includes the index uh, and the actual digitized versions of the registers. So obviously you can go straight to the digitized versions and browse, but we would suggest you go to the names index and when you're in this sheet you can go back and forward between one another in the links on these two pages. So this is where I'm crossing my fingers there we'll go that this is going to work. So it's basically it's, it's just a spreadsheet uh, and it defaults to the bottom of the spread, spreadsheet for, for some reason. So basically this is to aid access, um, obviously the absent voters lists are organised by constituency and within that polling uh, district, within that registration unit and then within that um, townland or street alphabetically, which means you, you would need to know where somebody lived in order to find them as you go through the absent voters lists or uh, in their original form. So. Uh, and a very kind thanks to a couple of volunteers who have been doing a lot of work on this to get it to where it is. Um, we've had a couple of volunteers in who have been going through the original records to compile uh, an indexable list which is now ordered by, so you've got a county list for Arma, Arma and Derry um, which means you can search by surname. So you can just basically browse alphabetically. Um, or you can do a control find. I'm going to go Smith because I'm about to find one. Um, which takes you down to uh, the person you're looking for. So for example, now I'll cross my fingers this works correctly. So for example, if I'm looking for a Cecil Smith, um, the information, and it, it's not as easy to see, but the surname and forename are slightly darker in grey, as are the constituency and page number, and that's what you need to access. So I would take my Cecil Smith, and I would go South Armagh, page 277. And from there, I would go into my digitized lists, and I would go to South Armagh. doing something. Hopefully. And 
from here we should be able to, what did I say, page 277. And if you just expand. <coughs> should be able to find higher, oh yes, Cecil Smith. So there, as you can see, so the index gives you uh, surname, forename, uh, registration unit, polling district, and the address, and it will give you your constituency and page number, which then will allow you to go into the digitized version, and this is where you'll find uh, the service details. That uh, works for uh, Derry London Derry as well, but I'm just going to that because you have two versions. So again, you do the same. <coughs> and we go into the names index. Uh, as Ian mentioned, there, there is a printed and a manuscript list. So here you will have two numbers. So works, the index itself works exactly the same. Uh, it's ordered primarily by surname with a secondary sort on forename. And if you find, uh, let me say, Thomas George Lonsdale Alexander, just because he has a very unusual name. He's on page 41 of the printed list and page 2 of the manuscript list. So 41 and 2. And just before I move out of the index, uh, just to show you also, you can use your sort options, and this is just what we've been working on. This will be quite useful. You can also sort. Um, so where, where it's rural, it's by townland. Where there's a town or a city, uh, it's by street. And you can sort, so it, it defaults to a surname sort, but you can also sort by, this is a particularly useful one, for example, by townland or address, which will allow you to see how many people from a particular townland or from a particular street, once it should work, once it sorts, which again, depending on the nature of your research, particularly for the military historian, I think will be particularly useful. There we go. So you can start to see and build up a picture of the volume of people, Abercorn Place, Abercorn Road, you know, the volume of people serving from particular areas, which again, depending on the nature of your research, will be particularly uh, useful in some circumstances. So, as I said, who was I thinking about finding the first? So if we go in to the digitized versions, here basically you'll just see two versions instead of one. So we'll, we'll have London Dairy City printed version, London Dairy City manuscript version. So I think, um, this was on page 41, Mr. Alexander. These are quite big files. Uh, so. so there we go. There is Thomas George Lonsdale Alexander. You can see down the place, and there's how you get into details. And we'll just look from now in the manuscript version.
think it was on page two. Did anybody see him? Down in the bottom. There we go, yes. Thomas GL. And he doesn't have an amend, but you can start to see that uh, there are a lot more, there are more amendments in this. So some of them remain the same, some of them have slightly different amendments. Uh, as, as Ian mentioned, we think the manuscript version was a later addition basically for ease of updating, organized alphabetically within the constituency, we're assuming just to make updating quicker and more and more efficient. So it's likely that any updates here are slightly like later editions, but again, would be we would be suggesting for the interest of completeness, you look at both. So really that is, that is it. Uh, these are now uh, up and available on the Pony website. And hope you have a look uh, and, and enjoy your research. And all that remains to do from, from our end is to thank all of our speakers for their participation today and thank you all for coming. Hope you enjoyed it and hope you find this a useful resource. Thank you very much. <laughs>